my family is impacted by DYT1 dystonia. Uh, my son is, uh, suffers from DYT1, and I know that's where the, D, uh, the torsin A protein is not, is, is not uh, manufactured correctly. And Rose, I know that you came up with uh, an unexpected breakthrough in your study of DYT1 and torsin A. And I was wondering whether you could explain in layperson's language what you came up with and why it's important. So what we did is um, we knew that torsin is, um, so the human gene is torsin A, but torsin A isn't just a human protein. Actually, there's a torsin A in all animals, but only animals. And we went to fruit flies, which is a very simple model system, but super classic for biology. And we asked what happens in that system when torsin is removed, because it gives us a new insight into what does the protein actually do? What is it important for? And um, doing that, we made a new finding that torsin is regulating a process whereby the cell makes lipids. And these are the building blocks for membranes, uh, for energy storage. Um, and that was, that was a very new thing. And because we were working also in fruit flies, they're a great model organism because you can, you can order these different genetic lines from a central repository. And so we were able to do that. So not only did we sh find that torsins were controlling lipid metabolism, lipid production, but we took some genetic mutants for genetic, for lipid metabolism. We crossed the flies together and we were able to find um, a particular approach that overcame the problems of losing torsin in the fly. So it actually gives us a proof of principle that there is a way to get between torsin and the physiological defects downstream of that um, via manipulating lipid metabolism to normalize it after torsin's dysfunction um, has taken place. So um, yeah, that's, that's what the, um, the paper was. We were real happy with it. It was pretty multidisciplinary in the end. Um, so so is that, does that mean you were able to understand better the mechanics, or were all able to understand better the mechanics of how torsin A interacts with the, the cell metabolism? So Thomas is the biochemist here. So he really deals with the mechanics, like the machinery of what torsin A is doing. We actually kind of go a, a step downstream and try and ask, so we try and not get too much into that because it's not really our specialty, but just ask, what is torsin doing in the cell? What aspects of cell biochemistry are perturbed? We still have to solve the mechanics of it, but we found a particular cellular process that was, that was going wrong, and by correcting it, so torsin was still mutant, we came and corrected it behind that, mm -hmm. And, um, and the, the defects that the flies had uh, were reconciled. Wow. Yeah. And, That's uh, great. That's great. <laughs> and, 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 and Thomas, so you, um, you had done something that no one had done before. You imaged a th a th in a three-dimensional way the structure of the torsin A protein molecule. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that and why that's important to research? Sure. So, <clears throat> yeah, so I'm, I'm a structural biologist, biochemist. And um, what we do is we try to understand proteins at higher resolution, which typically means atomic resolution. And the reason this is important is, in essence, every protein that, that a cell has, and there are thousands of proteins in a human cell, each one has a distinct shape, most of them have, and because of that distinct shape, they fulfill a distinct function, and so therefore, we are interested in understanding this, this structure because we think that when we understand the structure, we can understand the function better. And so <clears throat> this is what, that was the motivation to um, solve, as we call it, solve the structure of torsin. Um, this is done with a technology called X-ray crystallography. These are tiny molecules that are too small for microscopes. So we have to come up with, we have a special technique called crystallography with which we can solve this structure. And so we did that. So we solved the structure of torsin A and it's particularly also solved the structure of the dystonia mutant. And so in comparison between these two structures, we can now tell in really excruciating detail what the difference is between the two. And we have also solved a cofactor that interacts with torsin and cannot interact anymore with the, properly with the dystonia mutant. And so we have at least gotten to a sort of 
initial understanding what, what actually may be wrong in the sort of basic mechanism of, of this protein and why there's a problem in the, in the disease. So both of you, I mean, we're, as a, a parent of, of a child that really suffers from dystonia, um, I'm thrilled that we have you working on, on our team really here. I think it's great. And I was wondering, from your perspective, um, what has the DMRF done to help further research? And what more do you see uh, happening in the near future in this field? Do you want me to go first? Yeah. Sure. Um, so, I think I first started interacting with the DMRF around year 2000 even. So it's, I'm not so even that old a researcher, but it's been almost a 16, 17 year relationship. And I don't think I'd be doing any dystonia research if it hadn't been for the DMRF. Um, supporting my old mentor, um, supporting me as a, when I was first an independent scientist. So for me, for my personal career direction, um, the DMRF have been absolutely central to this. So the work that we published last year, the DMRF to some, I mean, are really behind this. Um, the support that's existed to me as a junior scientist has been, was critical, without a doubt. Um, I think also the visibility that DMRF brings to dystonia, particularly in the basic science community, is critical as well. Um, clinical neurologists, they are aware of dystonia. But something like the DMRF existing, it's something that a basic scientist will also come across and realize that there is this disease and maybe see an overlap with their research. Thomas? Yeah. I mean, well, I got in the field uh, essentially because I got a grant from DMRF when there's simply an idea. I mean, I just had an idea and, and, and I got funded for it. And that's. Um, very unusual. So most, especially funding by the NIH or government agencies always depends on, on preliminary results. And so here I could really propose something without anything. And that didn't only trigger me starting uh, working in Estonia, but then actually allowed me to then generate results with which I could then apply for more money from 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 the government, so it's a it's a big jumping board essentially, and uh, so it's it's critically important. And I think sort of yeah, going forward, um, it's it's going to be important to continue this and um, yeah, just increase the visibility for 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 this disease. Right. Well, I, I know that you know from what I've learned in my um, in my years with the foundation is that. Medical research, although we'd like it to be a straight line, it's really not a straight line, right? It's st two steps forward, one step back. Maybe we take paths that we that nobody uh, thought we would take in the past. And I know that you, ha you both of you, are in different areas uh, covering dystonia research, but um, I know that you work together, uh, and your or your your work is used by each other, uh, building upon our base of knowledge. And I want to say again that we really appreciate the work that you're doing, and it's just getting us closer and closer to our end result, which is fu ultimately finding uh, better treatments and a cure. So yeah. thank you very much. You're very welcome. Okay. Thank you. Okay.